Now, I was totally prepared to be underwhelmed by WrestleMania Night 1. I really was. Because on the surface, looking at this card was boo-boo. It did not captivate me. It did not interest me. And, to WWE's credit, they certainly over-delivered. I'm trying to balance the fact that um, is some of that due to just the incredibly low expectations that I had in, in, heading into night one, and therefore the fact that they exceeded them makes it look a whole lot better than it really was? Maybe. Or maybe it was just the fact that they ultimately connected on the show. It wasn't perfect. There were certainly time management issues. Like, we certainly could have cut out the fucking country guy singing America the Beautiful. Oh, God, that was terrible. And I realize I'm old and out of touch, maybe, but I had no clue who the fuck that was, and apparently I wasn't the only one. Yes, I know you're in Dallas, Texas, so you bring in the Cowboys cheerleaders, but, you know, and that adds to the feel of the show. Like, that's some, some of that stuff makes sense, but, you know, when you can't find a way to fit in the New Day and the Sheamus and Ridge Holland match, but you have all this other shit and all these other video packages, you know, like, it was far from perfect. But it ultimately connected, especially for it being night one. The, the question or challenge could be, can they meet or exceed it in night two? Certainly didn't open up great. Like I said, you had the lame-ass uh, rendition of America the Beautiful by whatever the hell his name is. Brantley Gilbert or whatever the fuck. It doesn't matter. Glad I haven't heard of him because he sounded terrible. But that SmackDown Tag Team Championship match uh, certainly was not a hot start to WrestleMania. Now, maybe it didn't go as planned because of Rick Boogs' uh, reported injury here, but you know the reason or justification doesn't change the result. I looked at this match going into it and said, yeah, this probably could have been saved for a SmackDown. It certainly felt that way after this one because this was a lame start to WrestleMania. Sometimes shit happens. It wasn't anybody's fault, but you know, the result is what matters here. And it's unfortunate that the Usos, you know, if you're going to have them win here, it was kind of a counterproductive thud versus something that could have been a really cool moment. Um, and speaking of counterproductive thuds when it could have been really cool moments, you look at Drew McIntyre versus Happy Corbin. No, I'm never going to let it go what they did with uh, the bum-ass Broke Baron Corbin character. Because that character literally could have been a foundational building block for this year's WrestleMania. Like, you literally could have main-evented that character if you did it right. And instead, he's sitting second match on the card with a character you don't care about in a feud you don't care about. And you got Drew McIntyre, who, within the past couple of years, has beaten Brock Lesnar multiple times, and he's main-evented big shows. He goes from all of that to being second match on the card against a character... You don't care about in a feud and story you really don't care about. That's not cool. I spent half of this match thinking about how somebody had to explain to Vince what Mad Cat meant. And thinking the first time he heard that, he's probably like, Yes, let's get creative on that. Let's create some Mad Hatter gimmicks. And they're like, No, that's not what it means. Like, he probably still doesn't fucking get it or understand it. But ultimately, as much as I didn't care about this match, the crowd popped at the finish. The sword spot was kind of cool afterwards. Shame they wasted it here, but clearly the fans liked it there, so that's good enough. Uh, the match that really picked up my interest in this show on Saturday night was the Mysterios versus The Miz and Logan Paul. It's crazy to me. Rey Mysterio debuted in WCW in the summer of 1996. I just got done with my freshman year of high school then. Yes, that means I'm old, but that also means that Rey Mysterio is old and even older than me. He's 47, and he's still able to do this and still perform at a pretty high level. Like, that's damn impressive. What's our excuse? And shit, Miz is 41, and he's been in the WWE for over a decade and a half. That's crazy to think about as well. And this is a type of interesting mid-card feud with mid-card performance. I don't mean there's a disrespect to Rey Mysterio or the Miz, but like where they're at in their careers, like they're well-suited here in this spot. I also thought it was fitting that Dominic was rocking the hairstyle and the gear inspired by his real biological dad, Eddie Guerrero. The real ones know, damn it. And with all that being said, this ended up being a Logan Paul showcase and a damn good one. I'm not sure if I was feeling the, uh, the Killer Bees ensemble there, like who was supposed to be B. Brian Blair and who was jumping Jim Brunzel. Um, but Logan Paul, while not Bad Bunny level wasn't bad. Like, sure, a little rough in some spots, but the way they featured in this match was really well done. Like, they limited the spots, but when they did, they allowed him to emphasize what he could do. He's an athletic guy. You know, when you look at him, for those wrestlers or talents that aren't on the WrestleMania card that are pissed off about it, well, why don't you look at Logan Paul and see what he fucking can do that you can't and go work on that. 
because he certainly has the look of a wrestler. Like he was by far the biggest, most imposing physical presence in this match. And then you look at him and you say, okay, not only that, he has a, an aura about him, a presence about him, a charisma about him. He actually knows how to get heat. He's got a naturally punchable face and personality. And then he doesn't get scared of that or afraid of that. When he hit that three amigos spot and the fucking frog splash where he's doing the Eddie inspired shape. Like that was genius level stuff there. That was fantastic. Like to the point where the fans were popping after the match because Miz turned on Logan Paul, now setting the table for a return match featuring the two of them. It was brilliantly done. When you talk about celebrity matches at WrestleMania all time, this is near the top of the list, certainly not the bottom, and damn sure not in the middle. And even the way they executed the finish here, Miz pins Rey Mysterio. So that way you don't have the celebrity pinning one of your active talents. You don't have Dominic losing in his WrestleMania match. You've got Miz pinning Rey Mysterio. You know, it's a respect shown to Miz. Doesn't hurt Rey one bit. Like, this was really well done. I enjoyed that match tremendously. Um, more than I think I enjoyed the Raw Women's Championship match, which should have been the women's match that went on last. Certainly over fucking Rousey and Charlotte Flair. And if you couldn't see that coming, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. Not that it mattered to me that much, because I wasn't that engaged in the Bianca Becky story myself, but it is what it is. Uh, anybody else find it convenient that Cody Rhodes is back in WWE and all of a sudden now we got the Texas Southern Marching Band? You got an HBCU doing the big entrance for Bianca Belair? That's right, Cody, new company, same end to racism as always. Uh, that was pretty cool. Becky Lynch's gave a Bowie look? Uh, not so much. Um, this match wasn't exactly to me a crisp, true work of art by any stretch of the imagination, but. It worked. The finishing sequence was great, well-timed, well-executed. Bianca gets her revenge. You've been waiting for SummerSlam since this, for this moment. You got this moment. The Twitter riots averted. Everybody's happy. And that should have been the women's match that went on before Austin and Owens. And that's the WWE, you know, not understanding what they had and more importantly, trying to force the other match. More on that in a moment. Uh, but Seth freaking Rollins, we finally found out who his mystery opponent at WrestleMania was going to be. And it's funny to me, is they basically took the same entrance, the same music, the same Homelander gear, and they made Cody Rhodes feel a million times bigger than he ever did in AEW. I Because mean, I cannot deny that initial reaction when the music hit and he comes out, like that felt big league. Like that was absolutely a WrestleMania moment. It absolutely was. Like, the crowd was electric. It was one of the biggest pops of the night. It was an Austin-level pop, but it wasn't that far behind. However, what the crowd got past, you know, whatever the fuck Seth Rollins was wearing there, and the fact that it's Cody Rhodes, a few minutes into the match, they realized, oh, it's Cody Rhodes. And the crowd goes miles for several minutes. Yes, they ended up getting the crowd at the end, but I'm sorry, this match went too damn long. This was the longest match of the night. They could have accomplished so much by going half of the time. Now, if your design was to only have this be a one-off and then not feud post-WrestleMania, maybe. But if you designed them to have a program post-WrestleMania, we probably didn't need to have a freaking 20-minute match here. Now, does this mean that Cody Rhodes is now a main event or a top guy? Let's see how WWE follows up on this post-WrestleMania. Because they could insert him into a big top spot. Or he could be the same Cody of the past in a year from now. Hard to determine. Because ultimately, he debuted in the middle of the card of night one of WrestleMania. Let's not get too crazy here. It took him 20 minutes to be Seth Rollins. That's all I'm saying. Um, like I said, the match was just too long for me. The spot where Seth hits him in the back and says, Welcome back to the big leagues, bitch. I mean, that was funny. That was cool. Um... But yeah, I think this is one of these matches where I'm more interested in the moment. And a lot of the other people that were watching the show or watching this video will be more interested in the 20 minutes of chain wrestling and moves and shit. And I'm more about the moment and what it represents. So just difference of perspectives, I suppose. Um, but Cody is more at home in WWE. Cody is a better natural fit in WWE especially if he is still of that kind of insecure mindset that he doesn't want to be a heel. He doesn't want to be booed. Or even if he can be, it'll work better for him in WWE. 
Like it, it, he just works better in WWE. It's where he belongs. And if anything else, like I got that feeling in that sense, seeing his debut and seeing him wrestle, he's just better suited here, honestly. Um, so anyways, that was certainly a WrestleMania moment. It was, it absolutely was. Uh, the SmackDown Women's Championship. Uh, what's your WrestleMania moment here? Please don't say the godforsaken nip slip. That was terrible. Um, please don't say Charlotte Flair winning because when are they ever going to stop forcing Charlotte Flair down her fucking throats? I'm sorry, not sorry, but if you guys can't see, she's getting the same Randy Orton treatment of a decade ago and she can't even execute as well in the ring as Randy Orton could. Like, this is ridiculous. This match stunk. It was sloppy. It was all over the place. You know, how many times are you going to keep putting Charlotte in big spots and she keeps being a botchy bitch like this? Like, I can't imagine sitting there being a fan of Charlotte Flair. First of all, I couldn't imagine being a fan of Charlotte Flair. But second of all, imagine being a fan of Charlotte Flair and being disconnected with reality to think where she's a great performer. She's not. Like, what's the appeal? But what, this is an example, though, of their... They just had to force this. And they did. And the finish sucked. Going to spear into the ref, so you take an unnecessary ref bump. And then of all the shit you're going to do, you're going to have Charlotte win be a beating Rousey with a kick to the face. It was fucking dumb. This was a letdown. Not a letdown in terms of expecting this match to be better than it was. I expected this match to not be good, following up a story that wasn't very good heading into Mania. But it's the fact of, I went from the Logan Paul match to Bianca and Becky, to Seth and Cody, to this wet popcorn fart abortion of a match. And maybe that was the genius of it. It was all by design to make sure that everybody was well rested and ready to roll with that main event. Because they certainly had plenty of excuses here because that match sucked. Charlotte and Ronda was easily worst match of the night. Because of the spot, because of the players involved, because of the circumstance and situation. Like, it was the worst match of the night, period. If you don't like it, argue against a fucking wall. But God, this main event with Kevin Owens and Stone Cold Steve Austin was fantastic. This is the most Kevin Steen I've seen from Kevin Owens since he's been in WWE. And it worked spectacularly here. For those that are going to complain because you're going to say something like, Austin was backstage, and when they asked him to put KO over, what? That doesn't work for me, brother. Give me a Steve Weiser, brother. I mean, calm down. You think Kevin Owens was buried here? Please explain to me how that works. Kevin Owens is going to get a massive payout for main eventing a WrestleMania night. Kevin Owens main evented a WrestleMania night this year. A few months ago, didn't even know what his contract status was or whether he was even going to be back with WWE. He was in this main event spot, which is going to mean a huge payout for him. Bury me like fucking that. Oh, and furthermore, in order for him to be put in that main event mania spot, which equals a main event mania payday, that means that Vince McMahon had to have enough confidence, belief, and trust in him to pull this shit off. That is not a small deal. Buried my ass. Oh, and furthermore, not only did Vince have to trust him here, most importantly of all, probably, Stone Cold Steve Austin did. They gave Kevin Owens plenty of mic time. They let it be a competitive street fight, not some quick squash job. How the fuck was Kevin Bar Owens buried here? If he's buried, it's because they dropped the ball following up on this afterwards. All this did was fucking elevate him. Man, Kevin Owens is so important that his Stone Cold Steve Austin's first match in 19 years at WrestleMania was against Kevin Owens. All the people in WWE history that don't get that Austin match, he did. Fucking the Tribal Chief Roman Reigns. Sure, he's facing off against Brock Lesnar, but he sure as hell isn't facing off against Stone Cold Steve Austin in Austin's effectively retirement match at WrestleMania. Get equipped. Get a clue. Fuck, bury me like that in wrestling or in life if that's the treatment I'm going to get. Put me in the main event of a night of WrestleMania in a spot against Stone Cold Steve Austin in his home state of Texas? Fuck yeah, inject that straight into my veins. 
And I'm hoping Austin gets the itch here. And maybe the Saudis will look at it and say, you know what, we've got an idea of it. We're going to take Bill Goldberg and Stone Cold Steve Austin and it's a bald guy barrel of oil on a pole match and booking for the next Crown Jewel show in Riyadh. Yeah! And then The Rock was watching this and he says, you know what, I've got the itch. And Roman Reigns, the tribal chief, if you smell what The Rock is cooking, I'll see you at WrestleMania Los Angeles, bitch. And then, two years from now, WrestleMania 40, what a gallon spectacular could be. John Cena is on some movie set somewhere, and Randy Orton's watching somewhere. And they're like, you know what, we've got an idea, John Cena versus Randy Orton. One more time, for a title, it doesn't matter what title, Triple H is the guest referee. John Michaels as the outside enforcer. It's breakfast club business, baby. John Cena, Randy Orton, one-on-one, -on -one, finally at WrestleMania. This time it counts. And then night two, it's Stone Cold Steve Austin versus The Rock. Let the young lions roar. Yes. Yes. But God, that segment with Owens and Austin, the KO show segment, let alone the match, was fantastic. It was so much fun. I wasn't sure I was going to feel about it, the fact that this meant that the show lasted past midnight, but fuck, it doesn't even matter. Like, that's a way to send the home fans home happy after night one. And in fact, potentially sets an unrealistic expectation of being able to follow up in night two. Like, this was really good. If this was a mania show, just like this was the mania show, you'd have said, that eh, it was lacking some star power, but goddamn, it had some WrestleMania moments for sure, and everybody went home happy. And it would have worked. This one, night one, on its own, is better than probably half of the WrestleManias in company history. If you really think about it, that's not hyperbole either. Really think about it. It was far from a perfect masterpiece. Like, the lack of time management is still a problem. Just because your matches can go longer doesn't mean they have to. Just because you have it two nights doesn't mean that you need to make it four hours each fucking night. Let's get in and get on and get on with our fucking day. But there were some big moments here. This actually felt like a WrestleMania show, which was a pleasant surprise to me because I certainly wasn't expecting it heading into Saturday night. But, you know, obviously the big story here is going to be Cody coming back to WWE. I can see Petty Vince right now is just getting his rocks off and say, <laughs> I got one of AV AEW's EVPs here. And then Stone Cold Steve Austin in his first WrestleMania match in 19 years and it sent the phone, phone, fans home happy. And now you got to listen to some people talk about how Kevin Owens was buried, even though this totally elevated him. And if you ever wanted to be buried, you sure want to fucking be buried like this.